I am Karen Freibort, and I am here to worship the living God today. It uh, occurred to me this week that uh, we may worship the living God uh, here in the pews or online or streaming live or a repeat on YouTube or from an ancient scroll. So I, uh, I would like to just say that from Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. No matter which way we receive the word, let us receive it with open hearts. If you'll join, join me and enjoy the opening prayer this morning, please read with me. Lord and Creator, help us embrace the costly blessings which you desire for us, blessings that confound the wisdom and the strength of this world. Teach us to be your agents of preservation in a world touched by death and beacons of hope in a world shrouded in darkness. Transform us into your image through the crucible of the cross writing your mandates upon our hearts, made pure by your perfect love, embolden us to be your ambassadors through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Me too. Morning, everybody. Thanks, Karen. Um, Welcome, one and all, and from here far and out there somewhere. um, We have a great crowd here. We've got the choir here today. We're going to hear from momentarily. Woo! Um, And 23, it's a a Valentine's, almost Valentine's Day miracle. Um, So a couple of announcements just to bring, to, to refresh your, we're having the pastoral charge annual congregational meeting not this Tuesday, but the Tuesday after, which is Pancake Tuesday or Shrove Tuesday, uh, the day before Ash Wednesday, which is, is the beginning of Lent. So that's, so that's uh, the 21st at 2 o'clock. You can come here. We're going to do the same thing we did for our annual meeting here. You can come and, and be part of the meeting here, or you can Zoom in. We'll give you that information. To, uh, you can use your phone or you can use your computer. And um, so that, that's immediately to be followed by the official board meeting. So basically we go through the annual report from last year and think about the year ahead and whatever other items may come up. So that's, everybody's welcome to be part of that. Uh, so that's uh, a week from Tuesday. Then the next Sunday is uh, first Sunday in Lent, which, at which point we will have communion. So we're still doing communion with our little uh, bits, our little, what do you call those things? Hmm? Fellowship cups, excellent name. They have a name. Well, there's different companies that make them, so they call them different things. But fellowship cups. Uh, so we'll still be using those. Um, so that's on the 26th. Uh, now, I think we should probably mention that uh, in exactly five days, Bill Work is apparently turning 90. <laughs> Woo! Bill, that's you. <laughs> only, only 90. <laughs> No work. Um, okay, we'll talk about prayers and stuff in a bit. Lindsay, let's see who all's with us. Peggy's here. Uh, Lori Brown. Oh, I guess Ben, you're you're watching the lights at the back, Ben. Okay, because Lori, but Lori says she's tuning in somewhere. Lisa's out there. Cheryl Russell, um, Paul and Nancy, Joy Cooper, Jim and Donna Roberts, Barb Peel, Randy and Arlene Birch, Birch, and Sue Nicholson, Liz and Gary Matthews. Did I say Joy Cooper? Oh, she says Lindsay from Wales is with us. Hi, Lindsay. We just took her, I think we just took her off her prayer list because she's doing great. And Jan Tedford out in Blair Hampton. So welcome one and all. Um, let us now, I think we're going to be we're about to have the choir come. Did I forget something? Oh, IMB. Yes. Okay. So yesterday was the 
the isolated men's breakfast. Um, I'm going to do these. Can, can they hear me? There's, there's sound stuff happening there? Excellent. I've forgotten to put the sound on. So uh, they were out. People were asked to send in pics of them and their beloved, uh, being Valentine's Day. And also here we have Jim and Donna Roberts uh, smiling at us from their place over at Silver Beach. And they sent an extra. There's a few extra pictures here today. This is them because they went on a little river tour in Europe last fall. And this was them with their granddaughter. No, waitress. Ben, ben says granddaughter, but it was actually their waitress on, some, one of the, on a river. I forget which river it was. Danu, maybe? I, they'll, they can tell us. So they had a wonderful trip um, together. This is the Richies. John on his 80th. He's young. So much younger than Bill Ward. <laughs> and uh, his lovely wife, Lynn. So, so then he was having his breakfast yesterday, so she caught him enjoying that breakfast and then falling asleep <laughs> at that breakfast. He's eight. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Bass and Myrtle. Myrtle just passed away a few weeks ago. And, uh, so, yeah, it's a great I think that was a, one of the church pictures. I'm not sure. Yeah, okay, because it's on our, our board. Yeah. There's Dan and Roberta with their new great-grandchild, whose name is Rowan. Everybody looks pretty happy there. Very cute. Very cute. And the baby's cute, too. Speaking of cute, Ben and Janice. And I forget what they're eating, something unpronounceable. I told you it was unpronounceable. Ramasu. For breakfast? For breakfast? <laughs> Why not? Now, do you recognize these two? So, this is Doug Beatty and his wife Ann from 2002. They haven't changed a bit. They look just the same. Perfect. Branksom Hall, Centennial Gala. And that's, that was the, that was the, the works. Um, okay. So let's, uh, let's have our choir come on up and minister to us in song. They might win couples. They might. I can do it right here. I think this is pretty Come ahead. I'm going to go over here. Oh, 
Thanks, choir. Love it. I think we're on to our our next. Oh, I, will walk. I will walk. Gotta get ready. I think we started off on a company. I think I got it. It's a lot of paraphernalia. Yeah. <laughs> Hard to do with one hand. Okay, let's uh, let's stand and get our I gotta find my new pick. And I Thank you. 
There you go. I am. I'm feeling better. Not noticing it that much. Um, uh, Are you going to play this week? No. <laughs> Arlene and Randy Birch. Well done, choir. So looking forward to the day you don't have to wear those masks so we can see your smiles. <laughs> yep, I get you. Uh, oh, it was the Danube, uh, Jim says, the Danube from Bucharest to Vienna last October. Nice. Woo! Nice. And uh, Joy agrees with Randy slash Arlene about the choir. All right, what are we up to now? Time for, I think, offering. Who, who will we get today? Barb. Hill. Ba Barb. <laughs> <laughs> Barb and Sue, they could do it together. Barb and Sue. Thanks, Barb, for agreeing to do this. <laughs> good job. Sue, good to see you too. All right. She gives me a little water, it's me. All that we have is my love. Prayer time. So, a couple of things to point out. Um, um, Ron's brother died early this week, um, David, and he was pretty young, 66. Our condolences with you, you guys, and um, uh, prayers for that family, family of David Bain. There's a visitation tomorrow night at the Halberton Community Funeral Home, I believe. Tomorrow evening, just to drop by kind of thing, right? Yeah? Can you hear me okay? You can. Ron can't. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Sue Nicholson's mom died on just a couple days ago on Thursday. So um, Olive Cooper, who's been in our prayers, Ron, I think her her dad died like last year, wasn't? Yeah, just last year. So um, so that's all a little bit sudden, although she was she was failing. So uh, she was ninety three, uh, almost ninety four. She would be ninety four in May. Okay. Probably said in her 94th year, you see. That's where it confuses people. So the family of Olive Cooper. Um, others. Jane Johnson's surgery. Oh, Jane, yeah, Jane has her surgery on Tuesday, Valentine's Day. So prayers for Jane. And, uh, and the others. Yeah, Roberta. Oh, yes, Roberta's no, 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 Something to do with the new stuff going on. Mm -hmm. And in, uh, I don't know, it's just 
Recovery. That's okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna re- just re- repeat. Uh, Graham Reed. So uh, Roberta is asking for prayers for um, Lyle Moffat, uh, and uh, he died from massive heart attack. Did you say 63? So uh, and that's uh, his sister Trudy. We're praying for her and the family. And Graham Reed is a friend, a uh, um, son of a friend, I guess, that uh, was hit in, hit in a, a car accident in Toronto and is in Sunnybrook. Um, yeah. <laughs> and the, uh, the driver was in jail. Okay. Let us pray. Oh, uh, oh before I, I forget, Turkey and Syria. Yeah. Um, Make sure that they open so the family can come. There's only one way they can get any services in Syria. Mm. Yeah. Continue. Syria is in a huge crisis that way. Um, so we do have some information that the United Church has an appeal. Uh, you can go through the United Church M and S, um, and they they have partners like that are that are on the ground. Uh, they they didn't rush into this. They they look for there's two or three partners they have that they are um, giving funds to. So if you'd like to donate towards uh, helping people in Syria, both Syria and Turkey, they have I think they have ways, um, and uh, you you can J- Jan Lynn knows. And you can you can mark a check with you know or or just earmark it for Turkey, um, and it will go there. Okay, let's pray. Ah, oh, Lord, our hearts are heavy this day, especially with uh, this disastrous earthquake in in Turkey and Syria. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you with our prayers, with our our heavy hearts, and lay cast our burdens upon you because you do care for us and for the world in which we live. Um, we do not comprehend these things, Lord, but we trust you and we, uh, we leave this, this situation particularly with you, Lord Jesus. Um, Lord, that you would, uh, we thank you for a few miraculous recoveries, but that so many have lost their lives and lost loved ones and families. We ask for your, your intervention, your comfort, that you would help all those involved with recovery, with helping those who are homeless and, and hungry. Uh, Lord, in so many ways, and, and, and along with the difficulties of uh, helping anyone in Syria these days, Lord, we put it all in your hands. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. And we remember um, Lyle Moffat, the family of Lyle Moffat, especially his sister Trudy, and Graham Reed, as he recovers from this horrible accident. We think of the family of Olive Cooper, the family of David Bain, Kim R., Barb Stevenson, Henry Morgan, Gwen Atkinson, and Judy Grant. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. Matthew Thompson, Brandon and Petra, Ernie and Linda Collette, Jennifer Flatman, Bonnie Jackson, Ryan, Lois Rigney, her brother, Roy Riddell, Max Ward Sr., Caroline Argarides, Margaret Mark. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. <clears throat> we pray for Eleanor, for Craig Nickel, Vicki, Jane Johnson, especially as she has surgery on Tuesday, Brian Newstead, Ted Schultz, Alex Buxy, Jessica, Corey, Don, Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. 
Pray for Isabel Jolly and Walt Griffin Jr., Victoria Ancaster, Paul, Kelsey Barnum, John and Millie Payne, Ron Mark Jr., Mark and Teresa Beach, and Carol Parnell. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. Lord, we, we continue to think of uh, the people of Ukraine and a, an end to that war. We can continue to think of um, our struggles with disease, especially COVID-19, and seeking an, an end to that uh, uh, emergency, Lord, uh, and, and help. We, we lift to you Chris Rusk, and Don and Karen Tran, Darko Knezovich, Steve Wigan, and others that we bring to you in the quiet of our hearts. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. Well, we pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our living Savior. Amen. Oh. Ernie and Linda Collette. Hi, guys. Just signed in. Um, we are going to have Karen come and read our scripture. Karen, lead us in our prayer. You'll join me in the prayer of illumination. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded through Jesus our Lord. Amen. The reading today is uh, from Matthew 5, verses 21 to 26. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court, and anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. May the Lord bless, bless his holy word. Thanks, Karen. Let us sing. O Master, let me walk with thee in lowly paths of service free.
Didn't mention that um, so Barb Peel was here at choir practice on Wednesday, but that night she had a, that night or Thursday night? Yeah, that night. She had a, she had a tumble, ended up in the hospital. And had, yeah, so tell it on you, Barb. At home, yeah. So she's got bruised ribs as well, I believe. So she's, she's pretty sore. <coughs> um, so keep, keep her in your thoughts, your prayers. Um, okay, let's, let's pray. Lord, we uh, thank you that your word indeed is sharper than a two-edged sword, dividing between soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. Lord, so as we consider your word afresh this day, may you move in our hearts and minds and spirits and uh, divide there, Lord, and show us the truth that sets us free. Lord, help us to, to hear your voice and your grace uh, through your word, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I call this anger management, the sermon title, that is. And I've got this survey a report from a few years back, well, 15, actually, so from 2008. <clears throat> but I don't think things have changed a whole lot. I think it's fairly representative of society even today. Um, so this is, this is some of the, what the, the survey had to say. 64% say that the world is becoming an angrier place. Almost a third of people polled, 32%, say they have a close friend or family member who has trouble controlling their anger. Only that? Only a third? <laughs> uh, okay. More than one in 10, 12%, say that they have trouble controlling their own anger. Really? Okay. See, I think all these, these statistics are a little bit subdued because people aren't being entirely honest. But anyway, more than one in four people, 28%, say that they worry about how angry they sometimes feel. One in five of people, 20%, say that they have ended a relationship or friendship with someone because of how they behaved when they were angry. Hmm, that happens. So, <laughs> that's a little background, you know, statistically. So Jesus' words, we're going to get there in a minute, we're coming around to it, uh, are timely. I mean, these are what he said like 2,000 years ago, uh, but you know, he's speaking about this very issue. Um, and so the problem is not new. It's been around since you know, the beginning of time. Remember Cain and Abel? <laughs> so that's from way back. We, ha we do carry collectively and often individually a lot of anger. And, uh, but before we, we look at what Jesus has to say about all that, let's go back to, uh, I'm going to go back uh, uh, before what Karen just read, um, we, we did read, I think, uh, Ben, you read it last week, but we didn't talk about it. So we're in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, Jesus says this very pithy thing, and uh, very important for kind of understanding and interpreting the Sermon on the Mount, and the rest of Jesus' teachings. He says, this is verse 17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So lest we think Jesus is like, I'm eradicating the Old Testament law and, you know, doing a whole thing new. He says, no, that's not, not you know, this is, that was God's work then. I have not come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. So um, a little bit more uh, of interest, I think, for the, all you Bible scholars out there, <laughs> is to just recall now where this sermon took place on the Mount, that's right, that's why it's called the Sermon on the Mount. And you recall where the law came down from. Moses, it was up on the Mount, Mount Sinai, Mount, also known as Mount Horeb. So there's a couple of names for that in the Old Testament. So, Mount, Mount, uh, Mount, so Moses was up on Mount Sinai, gave the law. Jesus is up on the Mount and giving his, his teachings here. Uh, beyond that, <laughs> um, Moses is attributed, there are five books in the Old Testament attributed to Moses. So five big books, also known as the Pentateuch, also known as the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those first five books of the Bible. Now, of, of interest, in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, there are five major discourses by Jesus. Uh, so, uh, and, and the Sermon on the Mount is, is the first of those, uh, those fairly lengthy discourses. So basically what, what we're being presented with 
uh, in the New Testament is Jesus is now kind of like the new Moses and more. So, which is a pretty big deal, because Jesus is reinterpreting to the people and, and uh, elucidating for the people uh, the law of Moses. Now, they were, that was their religion. The Jews were people of the book, and the book was, you know, the, the, you know, the origins of it were written by Moses. So he was kind of like, and they didn't call it Moses, Mosesism, <laughs> but it was kind of like that. I mean, Islam is, you know, the writings of, of Muhammad. Buddhism is, are the teachings of, of Buddha. Confucianism is the con- teachings of Confucius. So, you know, um, so essentially, I mean, the, the beginning teachings of the Hebrew scriptures were through Moses. So he was highly revered and considered kind of almost, you know, you might almost consider him the founder of, of Judaism, except nobody would have said that because they, they believe that he was inspired by God. And uh, he was. So, uh, but he was the big guy. In, in the, the book of Hebrews, uh, the writer of Hebrews, this is further on in the New Testament, says, um, Moses was faithful to, uh, to, you know, to God as, as you know, the, uh, uh, the, a servant in the house. But Jesus is faithful you know, as the builder of the house. So, it's the, he, you know, he contrasts these two quite a bit. I'll go I'll going through the book of Hebrews. Uh, so, uh, Jesus is essentially the new Moses. And what he says is, I didn't come to abolish that law. I came to fulfill it. I came to fulfill it. I think that's a key interpretive word there. Uh, so, what does it mean to fulfill? So, basically, I believe what he, part of what he's saying is, you know, the, the law is foundational, it's foundational to the things that Jesus is going to bring to pass. But in Jesus, those things are completed. So it's like the foundation of the house is not the whole house. It's just, you know, you know the thing that holds the rest of it up. <laughs> and, uh, and the thing that it's, it's holding up, uh, you know, is what Jesus is going to complete. So, um, yeah, well, we're, we're going to get to that when we talk actually about specific commandment here. It's coming up. Um, also, you know, things that are kind of hidden are now full-blown. So the, the things are fulfilled that were hidden before. So, for instance, uh, a big part of the law of Moses was the sacrificial system. Huge part. You go through there, you can almost nod off. <laughs> Reading about who's got to get slaughtered and what part's got to get chopped off and where the blood's got to be sprinkled and, you know, cows and sheep and goats and pigeons. and <coughs> There's a lot of sacrifice. Now, see, that's... that's uh, you know, according to the author of Hebrews in the New, New Testament and, the, the, you know, the teachings of the New Testament, that is, that, that hides the full-blown thing, which is the final sacrifice for the sins of the world, which is Jesus on the cross. And uh, it all points forward, points ahead to that thing, which it could never fulfill, but Jesus fulfilled. So that's, a, for instance, of how Jesus is fulfilling, not abolishing the law. Uh, and, and there are actual, you know, predicted things therein which are now fulfilled that come to pass when Jesus comes along. I mean, basically, you know, uh, you know God will raise up a prophet like you, Moses. <laughs> Moses says that God's going to raise up a prophet like me, and, you know, he goes on. It's a prediction of Jesus. So, so in this instance, in the passage we have before us today, we have one of the best known of the, of the laws of Moses set before us. And even the people that don't know, what, if you said, what do you think the Ten Commandments are? And I think a lot of people today would say, um, <laughs> and they might guess at a few. They might guess, thou shalt not murder? And they'd be right. They'd get one. One out of ten. No. Sure. There, there's a, there are ten, uh, nine others, uh, as you know. So, you know, he, here it is. The first, he, and Jesus says to them, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, and no kidding, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. So, you know, the Sermon on the Mount takes several of the Ten Commandments, and then Jesus kind of uh, represents them to us in a fresh way, fresh light. So, here he is. <laughs> now, what was the point of this commandment? What, was, it, <laughs> was it so, is that, is that what God was really after in human society, and human lives, that we should, we should fulfill this by not killing each other. Good job, guys. <laughs> is, is that what really the, the God's whole purpose there? Jesus is saying, well, no. There's a whole lot more to it than that. Because what's behind us wanting to kill each other and even going through with doing it, which is something that we still do today, people do today. He says, but I tell you, 
You've heard that it was said of old, but I tell you. So he takes you know, quite a bit of authority to himself here. And, and, and you know, the new Moses, he's, he's putting things in different light. I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. He says, anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Libel is the word in the, in the original. I tell you that anyone who's angry with their brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Now, he says this three different ways here, because Jesus is, you know, the master poet, and the way Hebrew poetry works is, you, is a thing called synonymous parallelism, where they say the same thing three times, or two or three times, uh, and with different nuances, different uh, aspects added as he goes. Again, anyone who says to their brother or sister, I'm throwing sister in here, Raka! I shouldn't even say that from the pulpit. I mean, I know what it does to you. Raka. Now, so you got to go to the footnotes for that. It says, an Aramaic term of contempt. Raka. It's like, you can almost spit on somebody and say raka. Don't do it, by the way. Jesus says, again, anyone who says to their brother or sister raka is answerable to the Sanhedrin. So I think that's, that's in the original text. Uh, the, the one Karen just read said court. I think, is answerable answer to the court. So the Sanhedrin was the grand court, the, the supreme court for the Jews in Jesus' day. And by the way, it's, it's the court to which Jesus himself was held accountable and that condemned him and sent him off to Pilate. Uh, he says, whoever says to their brother, Raka, but anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. So that's the third way he puts it. Anyone who says, you fool, now in the, in the Greek, so Jesus spoke Aramaic, it got, got translated into the Greek. So this is, in the Greek, the word is moron. From which we get, guess what? Moron, exactly. Anyone who says, you fool, or moron, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Now, Jesus used very colorful language. Now, it, now he used the word that we translate hell more than anybody else that we find any other uh, teachers that we find in the New Testament. And the word is Gehenna. And it actually was a description for the garbage dump of Jerusalem. So you remember the days of the, the good old days of garbage dumps? And when they actually were a dump, you just threw your garbage out there, and then they burned it. <laughs> and uh, I haven't seen that for a while. I guess that's, I think it's against the law. And now, we, now it isn't even a landfill site, really. It's you go and you put your stuff in a great big bucket container and they, they ship it off. So the times they are at changing, but, and probably for the better environmentally. I'm sure. No, no, Godfrey disagrees. But anyway, who knows? We, we can have that conversation. Maybe burning is the way to go. But, but, that, but when I was young, that's what it, it was always burning. And of course, that's the way most of the world still does it today, because that's all they can really afford to do. <clears throat> so most cities, and for centuries this has been the case, there'd be a great big area where people dumped all the garbage and it just kept burning. And Jesus used, that's the description that was fresh in people's minds. They would know about it, you know, to, he uses for this word Gehenna. The fires of Gehenna, the, the fires always, the, the, the worm is never, the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. So he says, anybody who says fool will be in danger of that. Okay, strong language. So he's put it in, in uh, basically different three, th uh, three different ways here. And he's not the only one who has things to say about anger and our propensity for it. Uh, the apostles follow up with the same, same kind of thing. And I think it's important for us to hear this. Let the, the word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword. I love that verse. <laughs> I'm going to pump on that one, Karen. <coughs> um, so from Ephesians chapter 4, I don't know if you can find it in time for me. I'm going to read it a bit in context here. So this is, you know, Paul, Paul's letters, basically he explains, you know, the grace of God in Christ and how we're transformed creatures. And then towards the end of his letters, this is almost always the pattern, he begins to say, therefore, this is the kind of lifestyle, you know, ought to be happening with you, you guys. He says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, both rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. So he covered a lot of ground there. 
Uh, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Which is, you know, kind of the meat of where I'm going to be going with this. Now, so he, he strongly cautions us and even, you know, calls us out for our tendency to be, to be raging and anger, angry and brawling and slandering and, and all forms of malice. Interestingly, just a few verses before is this uh, much, much talked about verse, verse 26, which is, is actually quoting from the Old Testament. He says, and now the King James says, be angry, but sin not. This version says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. You've probably heard this. So it brings up the whole controversy, which is out there. A few years ago, I was at a conference, uh, and a guy named, a fairly famous teacher from southern Ontario, Bruxy Cavey, who is a famous pastor at Oakville, with multiple places where they, they watch his services. Um, he was a teacher, and uh, he, he's a really great teacher. But he, you know, he had a very strong view that anger was just not a, something for Christians to have. You know, that, that uh, in the new life, w- there is no anger. But then I, keep, I kind of go back to this verse that says, be angry, but sin not. So is he right? Was he wrong? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I'd agree with him completely. But I think his point is this, that most of our anger is not appropriate. Most of our anger is, uh, you know, is because our way is not happening and we're upset because someone is, uh, you know, is doing something to us and we're, we want to get them back kind of thing. Um, now, is there a holy anger? I mean, it looks like if you read the Gospels, Jesus had a certain amount of holy anger. Like, remember when he cleaned out the temple, and when he, when he calls out the Pharisees, and when he, you know, he suffered the little, you know, bring the children. He's, he says he was indignant when they wouldn't let the children come to him. So, you know, and, you know, if, if we have the life of God within us, is there holy anger within us, you know, against things like that are evil and abusive and, uh, and unjust? You know, man, I kind of think there is. Now, it's a tricky thing, though, you see, because we're so prone to the other stuff. Uh, to discern what the difference is. Uh, Galatians 5, I I quoted it last week. I said Galatians 5, 20-something, and it was actually 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, kindness, self-control, you know, all that. Well, just before that, he's got the opposite going. (laughs) This is verse 19. Uh, The acts of the sinful nature, or the flesh, as it is in the Greek, the uh, um, sarkos, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. And he's got quite a list here. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, sorcery and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, (sighs) drunkenness, orgies, and the like. (laughs) And the like, if you will. Well, a lot of the like was stuff that has to do with anger. I don't know if you picked up on that as we went through. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, dissensions, factions, and envy. You know, a lot of those are, you know, either part and parcel with anger or they're, they're in and behind the reasons, you know, the reasons that we have our anger. And one more. I'm just going to read you one more quick one. It's a little one. Hang in there. James. This is pretty well known. James 1, verse 19. James, who's the brother of Jesus, says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For human anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Human anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. So there's, <clears throat> there's something to work out here. And, uh, you know, I say this, this is a major struggle for me personally. I'll just tell you right up front. <laughs> and I'm guessing it is for many of us, that we struggle with anger. It's, a, it's, it, it's the kind of thing that creeps up on us almost instantaneously sometimes. I know it from childhood. I used to think that, you know, taking a hairy fit, I used to think that was named on mine, at least so. <laughs> um, I, I could just remember being, especially my brother, my brother who's two years older than me, just being infuriated with that guy. Like, he just, he, and he would just be, meh, didn't, Un- unmoved, and I would just be enraged for some reason. 
Uh, I, particularly, I remember praying croquet with him down at my grandfather's place. Beautiful croquet set, lovely lawn. And time after time, we just kept playing. I'm, I'm going to beat this guy. I'm going to beat this guy. And we just played game after game. Game after game, he would beat me. I, I don't think I ever beat him, ever. <laughs> and I would just get so furious. But then I would just take that croquet ball and whack it to kingdom come. So <laughs> I, I've told you this story before. First year university, um, I, w- I was kind of my... Be- becoming a believer in Christ, becoming a follower of Jesus. I was really excited about following Jesus for the first time in my life. I mean, I was Sunday schooled and church and all that, but, you know, it's like, I was, uh, and, and I, you know, of course, I wanted to influence the, 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 the others in my residence where I lived and, you know, in, 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 in a way like that I was a, a kind of person they might want to emulate and they might want to come and be followers of Jesus. Too. Except the thing was, I played basketball. And I'm a little competitive. So, um, I remember this time, so I, as I recall, and then we're going back a couple of years here, and myself and this other guy went up for, for a rebound, and I felt that the, guy, the other guy somehow fouled me or did, did something wrong, and he fell, on the ground, he fell on the court, and so I gave him a real good kick. <laughs> so, so instead of being Harry the sweet, gentle Christian, it was, my nickname was Harry the man kicker, so great. <laughs> <laughs> that tends to stick with you too, you know. <laughs> so yeah, that didn't help. So I, I just, I know that's there. Um, uh, it's still there. Like uh, from time to time, th- I, things that will affect it, and you probably know this in your own life. If you're, if you're tired, if you're hungry, if you're stressed, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's there even the more, even more quickly. The, the sense, but a lot of it. A lot of it is when you, you have this sense of something impinging on your rights. On, you know, you, we're very self-centered, by, and only Christ can change us from being self-centered. You know, it's impinging on what I want to do, you know, or, or it's affecting my pride in some way. So as we repent, as we grow in Christ, and we're less self-centered and less prideful and less arrogant, then actually there's less room for, for anger in our lives. So that's, that's one of the, the, the keys right there. So if you're thinking about this a bit, uh, you realize that there seems to be different levels. I mean, it's one thing for somebody to, say, accidentally drop a hammer on your toe. And you're mad at them briefly, like, and then you, you, you can deal with it fairly easily. It's another thing if someone uh, hits your child with a car, you know. That's a whole other cup of tea. And all those other kinds of things and abuses that have happened uh, and are happening in our world... Um, how do we deal with those things? I, I, I've got a book. I haven't actually read it. Uh, it was by Simon Wiesenthal, who's a, um, I, I think he's, he's dead now, but he was a, a Jewish rabbi who during, was in a, a concentration camp. And, uh, uh, you know, he was seeing his fellow Jews being, being uh, genocidally wiped out. And uh, a Nazi, a young Nazi officer was dying and asked Simon to come and, and forgive him. And the, the, the young fellow had grown up Catholic, and, had, and his father was very much against the Nazi regime and stuff, but he, you know, he went along with it. And uh, Simon, Simon couldn't. He, he couldn't or he wouldn't. He, I, I think he couldn't. I mean, there's a, there's a whole book, which I haven't actually read about it. But that, I mean, just, you know, how can you? Where, where, where do we get the resources to, to do this? Because... Um, how can you not be angry unless you forgive? Unless we forgive him or her, but where do you get the resources to forgive? And the answer for us is God's grace. And the answer for us is the cross of Christ. And the answer for us is always that we have been forgiven for everything you know, that we have done, do, are doing, will do through Christ's cross and through his blood. And we have needed that. I mean, Jesus t- tells this whole parable, I think it's the end of Matthew 18. So, I mean, this, this theme runs through the whole book of Matthew. Um, where, where, you know, to, to make a long story short, one guy who's been forgiven the national debt, this immense amount, you know, goes and then, you know, he is, he's got a fellow who owes him a thousand bucks and he starts beating him and throwing him in prison to get his money out of the guy. And, and he says, that's what it's like when we don't forgive each other after God has forgiven us completely. Um, so it, there's, there's a, we, we never get past that. 
There's, a, there's an old hymn, Jesus, keep me near the cross, there a precious fountain. Free for all, a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. Keep me near the cross. You don't get away from that. You and I are not, you know, graduated now. We are constantly in need of, of, of God's grace and God's mercy and God's forgiveness every minute of every day. And, and so we need, to, we need to be freshly partaking of that grace and that forgiveness if we are going to have the wherewithal to forgive others and deal with that anger. So it's not an easy answer, but it is, it's God's answer. So that's, you know, that's the kind of the first part. The second part, I mean, uh, you know, is when people do stuff to us and what we do with the anger. Now, the second part of this passage that Karen read is it has to do with when someone is angry with you. Because, <laughs> you know, it's not just all them that are doing the, the stuff that we should, they shouldn't be doing. We're doing it too. So the, the next two parts are, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and then remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift at the altar. Go and be reconciled to your brother or sister. Then come and offer your gift. And, and then the next part is more like legal. If, if you're, you're being sued, go and have a chat with the person that's suing you. <laughs> See if you can straighten it out. Because otherwise you're going to be turned over to the judge. The judge is going to turn you over to the jailer. The jailer is going to throw you in prison. And you'll not get out till you pay the last penny. Okay, so this is all about what you and I are doing to others. And he's saying, get out in front of that. Get out in front of that. You know, we're, we're, to, we're to go and confess. I know of a, a, a guy, a church I went to many years ago, <laughs> and it was uh, encouraged that we go and confess to others. And this guy, I think it was when he was a teenager, had gone and burnt down somebody's barn. And it was years later, and he did go and confessed to them, and they forgave him wonderfully for him. And it was, you know, a huge load off him, off his heart. And my, but, uh, you know, you can't count on that. You could be thrown in jail. <laughs> you could do time. Um, all these things are about learning to live in community, to get along, to love your neighbor. I mean, that was actually the, the, the men's passage for yesterday was, you know, it was it's not just love your neighbor, but uh, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this. That, that one lays down his life for his friends. Dealing with our offenses. You can be a peacemaker from both sides because you can keep yourself in check through forgiveness and you can help diffuse the other guy's anger toward you by confession you know, and by reconciliation. So, so all that is a far cry from don't murder, by the way. <laughs> That's the point today. It's not just don't murder. Jesus says, I, but I say to you, He's got a whole other plan. He's setting up his kingdom. He's building a new community, a community of love. You can't not be angry unless you forgive, and you can't forgive unless you're forgiven. The one that you, you, that you have done wrong to can't be reconciled to you unless they forgive, so you're asking them to do that, and you're pushing them to find the gospel resource, to find the grace of God in Jesus Christ when you and I go to them and seek their forgiveness. For us to live life fully, for us to love each other, we need to drink deeply and often from God's deep well of love and of forgiveness. And after all, this is Valentine's week. <laughs> That's what it's all about, the love. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word, for your strong words to us. Help us to uh, understand that our anger so often does not work your righteousness and your way and your will. Lord, and uh, we struggle with it. I struggle with it. We ask that you would continue to impress upon us how much we've been forgiven, the price that you paid for us at the cross of, Christ, uh, cross of Calvary, Lord, that we might uh, live lives of mercy and love and uh, and you might knit our communities together, even back together again. Lord, you might bring your reconciliation into our world and into our lives. Uh, Lord, even with those that we disagree with, love might be at the center of it all. So, Lord, we thank you for this, your word. Work it deeply into our hearts and lives. And we ask it in your name. Jesus, you who taught us in prayer to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us sing, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Charles West, 1747. Interact. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with each one of us, both now and always. Amen.